Hello and welcome to today's video. So this time we're going to be having a look through another batch of vintage penguin paperbacks. Now most of these date from about 1946-1947 and a real mixture of uh, titles and some really great authors and lots of crime titles as well. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy looking through them. So sit back, relax and let's get to it. Okay then, so we're starting with this one, number 557. Now, this one doesn't actually exist in a first edition. Um, no one's ever come across one. Uh, all of them say a reprint from 1949, but we don't really know the story behind it. But it is, it just doesn't, no one's ever come across the first printing. So we'll assume it just doesn't exist, but it's the next one chronologically. So it's a little bit out of place. You see it was published much later. This is number 558, Child of Jago. And this one's uh, 1946. So actually it is just after the war. And we will work our way through these and uh, we'll hopefully find any, any that have got bits of uh, writing in and things like that. We'll correct these as we go along. But we are work past the worst of it now, which was the uh, the obviously the very fragile wartime releases. And Bernard Shaw here, they published an awful lot of his. And this is uh, the first of like a run of 10. So they were published in editions of 100,000 copies each. So that he was instantly a million seller in paperback. And these are all sort of con consecutive numbers. A couple of them were re-released. And I believe... Um, at the time, it's difficult to believe now, but at the time, people were so into these, they were picking them up by in sets, if you can believe it, which is nuts. But there you go. Uh, Bernard Shaw was uh, a personal friend of Alan Lane, and uh, Alan Lane himself made a point of uh, getting as much of his stuff printed or put into Penguin as, as possible. So these all appear fairly much unread a little bit of spine fading on some of these but there's no writing in them or anything so uh so far we haven't needed to do anything which is quite good we are into a much more healthy period now for penguins so there was no more war restrictions um there's no paper rationing now things had almost you could say got back to normal uh you know as they were pre-war got a little one pound fifty in so that's okay apart from that it's a beautiful copy this is how you would often find them they'd say like 150 or two two pound penguin first um obviously referring to the first penguin printing now since i last did a penguin video i have had some good fortune and i found about three or four more from my list so amazingly i'm just down to four that i'm missing now to have a full set of the first thousand penguins in first edition um so i've been very very lucky and a dealer um has got the last four that i need but um it just depends if i'm lucky and my order gets pulled out of the hat if i win them or not so you know my fingers will be crossed so what I think we'll do, a bit like last time, we're going to zoom through these. Uh, we'll have a check of each one, make sure they're as good as I possibly can get them. And then at the end, we'll give them a brush down to take the dust off the top, which is in some cases considerable because that's like never been done. In other cases, it's not too bad. Um, so we'll just have to see. Some of these are really, really nice additions considering their age. They're like almost unread. And as I've said it before, if only we could all find them all like this <laughs> we'd be laughing wouldn't we 1946 that one so these are all still late late 40s 569 here the 11 11's worth case and this one's actually got you see that at the top there it's like tanned or sunned but unfortunately there's not a great deal i can do about that but you have to wonder the bottom is really nice and white but this top area look, and I think that could be a lot of that could just be dust, which in a minute, um, when we've been through these, we'll have a stab at trying to get rid of. Now, this is one of my favourite 
books and I must looking at it now I think I wish I had a really really nice copy of this one because I absolutely love H.G. Wells uh, as an author and I do love this particular book but it's a little bit yes yeah, okay it's a little bit more worn than I would like in all honesty still nice don't get me wrong but it's a little bit worn um, oh here's a, another copy of it I wonder if I just kept the extra yeah, this is still a, a first edition. So I actually kept, this is, a, this is my nice one and that's my reading one. So I, <laughs> I take it all back. Um, but this was another author which had 10 books. He had 10 books published at once simultaneously, um, to be another million seller by Penguin. Um, because it's Penguin science fiction, I do tend to pick up later reprints of certain titles. And that is why I've got a second copy here of, uh, War of the Worlds. And this is just this, is it the 60s one? Yeah, this is from 1964. So a little bit later, look at that. An interesting take on the war machine. It's a little bit later, but still in the right position. I've got some more now. As I said, they published 10 at the same time. Um, Island of Dr. Morrow. Some of them had already been published, like The Invisible Man was, in actual fact, Penguin 151. So that won't be in this run that we're going to see now because it had already been published and they just put a reprint of it out 572 here love and mr lewisham but once again these are all on the whole quite nice copies although this is another one which is a little bit more worn look at that time machine perhaps you know you could say one of his most famous ones this one and more of the worlds yeah, look, it's got an X library. So I think when I go through and edit this, I'm going to put this one on my list for one's upgrade. Really easy to get. It's not expensive or anything. And uh, I shall try and get another copy of the time machine. 574, History of Mr. Polly. The new Machiavelli. That's in the front there. That came off fairly easily. I said by this time the books had got really, they were back to their old sort of form really with how well they were being actually printed. 1946 still. Tono Bungay. Another one which is virtually unread. Absolutely gorgeous condition. Got a little name inside, but I don't mind that. George Meredith, Tragic Comedians. It's got a bit of pencil just on the inside weirdly down the bottom here so we'll try and we'll try and grab that now while we're here i think it's pencil yeah otherwise it's down there quite gentle because it's in a really really awkward spot in all honesty there we are we got it our first travel one we've seen since we started about time eh big thick one as well Two years before the mast. Yeah, if you collect penguins, if you, the ones from 500 up really are quite easy to get hold of. You know, you're not going to have to pay a huge fortune for most of them. Um, it's just the first 500 that are, you know, the toughies and, you know, tend to be the more expensive ones. 
Well, they definitely are the more expensive ones. Cardinal snuff box. Chesterton, author of the Father Brown mysteries, is probably his most famous ones. But this was also pretty, pretty big in its day. This has got a little. That's got a date inside. First of all, look at that, nine eighty six M. So we'll we're going to get rid of that. That's probably when it was last read. And I notice that the spine is coming away. Let me go crease right across the front. Apart from that, it's a really not too bad copy, but I'm going to have to get that glued in. So I have got my print stick handy here. And I put some glue in there just where it's coming away. Because it's in a bit of a poor old state, and I'd rather add some glue along there. Quite nicely. I think that's going to do it, to be honest. So now. Lovely. And then another JJ Connington Wardholes. And this looks really, really fantastic condition. Looks like it's never been read properly. It's really, really tight spine on it. I'd say that, I would hazard a guess and say that's never been read. Look at that, it's just like a little bit of binding glue down the spine there. Very, very nice indeed. A few little spots on the back here which are actually coming off when I put my thumb on it. I don't know what they were. Something historical. Yeah, a few little dots that have come off there. Hmm. Lovely there, that's good. First crime one in a while, but we have got loads more to come. Uh, here comes the copper, Henry Wade. Now you don't often find really nice condition crime books because they tend to get read and reread and passed around. Um, there are quite a few collectors. Look at this, so look, January 91, also 786. We've seen this before, haven't we? Where someone's recorded their reading and this is coming away from the spine. So, similar to the last one there. But yeah, there are people who collect just penguin crime. And I'd say, you know, it's a really great thing to collect. Um, it's also the most expensive genre of vintage penguin to buy. They're the most expensive ones, even secondhand. They really are um quite sought after and the thing is people generally know that they're collectible so they tend even stuff that's actually quite common they tend to just put a premium on without really much knowledge because you know oh, it's penguin crime so it must be worth a lot of money it's not always the case some of the very rarest penguin books are not crime books you know but in all honesty the majority of them are so uh, well that's why they command the big bucks but it's all good but I can see, you know, although I don't personally know anyone who collects crime, I did go up um, a couple of months back to a shop called the Ironbridge Bookshop. And they're a penguin specialist in Ironbridge, which is near Walsall, uh, near Birmingham. And uh, I was speaking to Meg, who's the owner of it. And she says she has one 
little old lady, little customer, and um, she basically fills a bag up of Penguin Crime books and then replaces it once every few, you know, couple of months. And she says, all the little old lady says to her is, just try not, you know, try not to have any doubles, basically. And I thought, how cool is that? It's like really harking back to the old days of like swapping out books and things like that, you know? And uh, you can imagine her, that lady's so well read. She must have read so many classics. But she knew that if she had a penguin crime, it was a certain level of quality. And I've come across this before um, with Penguin Books. So back in the 90s, I was uh, a bookseller for a national chain in the UK at the time called, what were they called? Dylan's. Dylan's, the bookstore, no longer around now. They they got bought by Waterstones. Um, but back when I was working for Dylan's, um, they did a signing with um, Terry Waite, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury's envoy, and he had gone out to try and negotiate peace in the Middle East and had been captured and was held hostage for about five years. And he was chained to a radiator. Him and there was a few other people, uh, John Joe McCarthy and uh, Brian Keane, and that's another one. And they'd all been held hostage in different places. And... Uh, because he was coming down for a signing, I thought I'd better read the book um, just so I could speak to him because I was going to be looking after him that day. And boy, oh boy, he he got a lot, a huge audience was waiting for him. And, um, to, you know, to sign his, his books, I think it was called Taken on Trust was his paper, was the hardback. So anyway, I read the book and in it there was a bit about when he was chained he, he begged his captors to get him something to read he said Look, i'm going out of my mind here can you get me some books and um they did bring a box of books but it was they were all in like um arabic you know something he couldn't read at all not a word of it not a single book in english and then another week or so went by and he sort of complained "Look, no good i can't read any of these then another week went by and then they came back with a box of books and it was all vintage penguins. And uh, he said his heart absolutely was completely raised because he knew, just glancing to see that they're penguins, he knew he had a whole box of really, really great sort of penguin um, books to go through, of which they were going to be of a certain quality. And that's... That's something I never forgot. Um, and I actually asked him about it. I said, I was reading your book. And he said, I'm a big penguin collector. This is back in the 90s. I haven't been collecting long. And uh, I said, did you have a favourite one? He said, no, I just loved them all. I read them all. There was classics. There was pelican books. There was a real mixture of stuff. And I just read read them and reread them multiple times, some of them, because I was, you know, they didn't get me any more. But I had a whole box to go through. And it was fantastic. And he did say, you know, in it would be quite fun to try and, if he could remember them all, to try and track down those original Penguin books. And I um, actually gave him the um, contact at the Penguin Collector's Society. So I don't know if he ever went that far as to uh, try and track them down. Now, this one here, I'm just going to get these other books as a bit of a guide. The bottom of the spine is looking a little bit... Yeah, I thought so. So it's come away a little bit. And I don't want it getting any worse. So I'm going to put some uh, print stick into there. But yeah, I wonder if he ever did try and uh, track down the penguins that he had when he was in captivity. But it just shows they were very much... I mean, the whole point of them was going to be to be the popular educator. And I think... They'd certainly succeeded with that with the Pelican books, but they also entertained and they entertained millions and millions of people over the years, uh, but particularly in times of strife. And uh, Penguin were very much active during the Second World War. And it was interesting how, you know, this is in the late 80s, 90s. Once again, they were helping someone who was in distress, in effect, you know, being held captive and prisoner, which I think is... Uh, Really, really interesting. Murder in the basement. Oh dear. But you look at these crime books and they are 
almost iconic, aren't they? They really, really are. This one's got the closed tear on the back, so I'm not going to interfere with that anymore. Uh, Henry James. This is a classic that I've never actually read. Turn of the Screw. I hear it's all right. Slightly coming away from the spine, but I don't want to pull it. It's still there. Comino. There's a bit of a grubbish bottom cover. Lobster side. No, I don't fancy it. Good stuff, all looking pretty nice at the moment. My friend Prospero, My Henry Harlan. Ah, now I'm going to keep this one exactly as is. And you see that little signature in the top corner there, H. Arnold, July 20th, 1948. H. Arnold, Harry Arnold was a penguin warehouse man and uh, he kept one of every single penguin book as they were being published and they're famous for being in exceptional condition. And he actually worked at Penguin, so I won't rub that signature out because it is one which is an important one. And I've got a handful by uh, from the Harry Arnold collection. I remember when it got put on the market back in the, uh, maybe in the late 80s, early 90s, I forget now. I didn't get any of the really expensive ones. I just couldn't afford it at the time, but I got what I could. This one's interesting because um, it's number 597, but the original um, number said 592, and they blacked it out and covered it over. One of those little post-war anomalies. This is uh, also the period where we see a few grey ones. So these are world affairs, and they didn't do many of these, about six. Um, and uh, these were, yeah, what they say, world affairs, penguin originals. You almost think that they should have come out as specials, really, but for some reason they, they didn't. A lot of them have got wartime themes, like this one here, Anatomy of Peace. I remember finding these and thinking, yeah, these are really, really beautiful condition, unread, unread copies. Oscar Wilde, Salon, another place. So really, these aren't too bad, are they, condition-wise? We've had a couple to repair, yeah, fair enough, and a few little things to rub out, but we've done pretty good so far. Um, a biography now, Lewis Hastings, Dragons Are Extra. Don't know much about this chap. Big 10p inside there. On to 1947 now. It's quite a... Now this one I'm definitely going to put on my upgrade list. Because it's just holding it. It really does seem quite worn. So at the editing stage, we've got something to look at there. At the editing stage, we're going to... I, I always have my wants list open and I'm going to be putting this one on as an upgrade. I'm not going to bother repairing it. It's just really, really worn, that one. But it did have an insertion. And what is this? Millwards, Corn Market Street, Oxford. Hmm. Well, I can't quite see what it's for. It's sea pasties. I don't know. But someone's used it as a bookmark. Now, we'll definitely be going on to one of my all-time favourite penguins. This is... It really is one of my favourites, and I absolutely love this, and it's Hiroshima. So it's by reporter John Hershey. There he is on the back. And he went into Hiroshima after the bomb had gone off, and he was able to sort of track down a few people, and he got their stories um, about what they were doing leading up to uh, the bomb going off and uh, what they did immediately afterwards and what care they needed and things like that. Now, when this came out first, it was published in... 
the New Yorker magazine in America. It has one special issue. I've got multiple copies of this because I love it so much. Um, so it came out um, in the New Yorker magazine and uh, it was an instant sellout. And Alan Lane, the publisher of Penguin, being Alan Lane, thought I have to bring it out as a penguin. Uh, but the thing was, time was very much of the essence because lots of other newspapers were looking to serialise it and things like that. So he managed to get it pretty much out within about six weeks of the magazine being published, which was quite an achievement. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Honestly, the stuff you find in these books. So that's my three copies of the regular edition and then it got released as a penguin special which is in my penguin special collection and it did also come out slightly later as a penguin modern classic with a new jacket as you can see i think it's got possibly a new forward or after forward something like that in this edition um yeah publishers no Actually, that's the same as the first one. It just recounts basically the story that I've just told you about how they were able to get Hiroshima to print in such very short order. And it really was, uh, you know, telegrams across the Atlantic to get it in. But it's a fascinating story. And I've done a whole dedicated video about how Penguin got Hiroshima um, to print um, on my other channel. So um, do go and uh, check that out if you're interested. Here's another one, which I'm afraid to say, I'm going to put this on my wants list. It's so grubby compared to so many of the other beautiful ones that we've been looking at today. However, Gladys Mitchell, boy, is she collectible. And uh, her books are quite hard to find these days. Robert Graves, brilliant, great, great author. Um, obviously famous for the two Claudius books, Claudius and, and, uh, and Claudius the God. And I, Claudius, was the other one, wasn't it? But he did a lot of other great stuff and Penguin pretty much published it all. Oh, Robert Graves. Night in Glengale, John Ferguson. A bit of pencil there to rub out. 1947 now. This has got the remnants of a, a second-hand price by the look of it. Not in the greatest of conditions, but it's not bad. It's just a tiny bit grubby, but it's not one I'm going to put on the list, like uh, that Menace, for example, that Richard Caverne. This is a bit washed out, isn't it? Look at this. This is another one that I think, now that I'm looking at it, it's about time I upgraded this, because it won't be expensive. So number 607, Anson's Voyage Around the World. It has got a map inlaid into it. That might cause some problems, but I'll have a look. But now that I'm reaching, you know, basically the end is in sight now for collecting penguins for me, the first thousand at least, I'm going to go back. And um, as I've been making these videos, anything that's particularly tatty, I've been making a note of and uh, it's been put on my upgrade list. Um, as I said, I was down to just I'm down to just four now and I was able to get my top upgrade uh, fairly recently, which was um, an upgrade to Brighton Rock. By Graham Greene, so really, really pleased about that. Um, in fact, I should have um, pulled my old copy out when I uh, when I dug these out, but I'll do it when I put them back because I think someone's going to want to have that because it's a really uh, sought after penguin. Nah, Patrick's mystery. Here's another grey, Labour's first year. I think they did one for all three parties. Actually, it was Labour's first year, and then I think it was the case for conservatism, I think was the other one. OK, 
can't quite remember now. Now that one has also got a bit of a top of the spine coming away. It's a really easy title to get. These are really cheap, but I need to just pop a little bit of glue in there, I think. Um, yeah, they're really cheap. They're not exactly sought after, except by people who collect, like me, collect the whole publisher's output. That's enough just to squeeze the end down. Yep, there we are. An easy fix. Case for three detectives, Leo Bruce. Another one that I wouldn't say was perfect condition, but. I'm not going to um, rush to get another one. But this is. Got a little two pounds fifty inside. So it says PL and it said PP then eleven F. Now the PP is being a bit stubborn, but the two fifties come out. Have a look, the, uh, the little peepees remained stubborn on that one, but we'll let it off this once. Aftermath Francesca M. Wilson. Now that's had a sticker on there, unfortunately, which I don't think I'm going to be able to do anything about that. And also on the back. Hmm. Let's just check the inside first of all. Well, that's okay, but on the back here, you can see this bit here is just curled up. Now, it's going to need just the tiniest, tiniest bit of glue, really, to pop that back in. Basically, just a smear, really. whoever had that on there there was this there was like that bit of an orange sticker there i think so we just ripped that off so i'm not going to interfere with that anymore because apart from that's quite a nice robust copy life class so Next week, I believe, is going to be the first week of doing some hardbacks. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. But I have to keep interspersing them with Pan and Penguin videos um, because we've got so many to get through. So, uh, And as I said, I do systematically want to do my entire collection. It's as simple as that. They all need doing. But I also am aware that I want to keep it sort of interesting for yourself watching each week, which is why I think some hardbacks might be quite good fun. So I don't think that this video is going to be that, it's not going to be an, an hour, even an hour, I don't think. Uh, we're going to be able to get it done much quicker than that. But it doesn't matter, because I said if you're stuck for something to watch, there's a massive backlist to go through. Yeah, we've got over, over 50 videos now, which is pretty good, isn't it? And uh, over 700 on my other channels. So uh, if you want a bit more detail and a little bit more, just head over there and you'll see much, much more. Right, Penguin Parade, a parade of penguins. Nineteen forty eight this one, so we have moved on ever so slightly. Covered it all of nineteen forty seven with this video. Dew on the grass. That's, I was gonna say this is a beautiful copy. It's the Harry Arnold connect um, Harry Arnold collection again. <laughs> Absolutely mint. I wonder what that looked like when you actually saw it. It must have been like straight from the printers but he worked for penguin right back to number 
from when they started in the Penguin Warehouse. So he kept one of every single one as they were published. What a collection. I wonder how far he went. It was over a thousand, I know that. Daily Telegraph second crossword puzzle book. I've just secured the Times third crossword puzzle book to get the last sort of post-war puzzle book out of the way. This one, like a lot of them, is absolutely typical. The first few puzzles have been attempted and looks like completed, and then it just fizzles out. It's always the way with crossword puzzle books. Funny, isn't it? I've never been that good at crosswords, sadly. Here's the Times third crossword puzzle book. This one's a little bit the worse for wear, but I don't really mind on crossword puzzle books. I don't really want to spend big money on them. And generally speaking, I don't tend to go through and like correct them all. So I could, I could, I suppose, you know, go through and take out this person's you know, workings as it were. But it's like, where do you, where do you stop at the end of the day? You know, do I do the entire um, puzzle? You know, I, I think you'd just be on a hiding to nothing. I'm just, as I said, I'm always just happy just to get one out, out the way. Um, this one has a tiny little bit of glue required at the bottom of the spine. So let me just get my screwdriver again smear that in there it's just a filler old copy this one so I'm not too worried about it if it stops it getting any worse it was pretty beaten up to begin with wasn't it but if it stops it getting any worse it's all right I said I'm not too worried about old crossword books it's just a matter of getting them out of the way, really. There is a chap um, who was able to track a, uh, track one down for me, which he sold me at, I believe, a very reasonable price, which is £11 for one that I needed. It was in lovely condition. And he's actually a puzzle expert, and he creates the crossword puzzle for the Sunday Times each week with Ian, Ian Allison, and uh, he's on Twitter as well. And his Twitter feed is fantastic. It's full of old crossword and puzzle books and they're in great, great condition. Absolutely fascinating. Obviously it's his specialty and uh, it's just such a great, great Twitter feed, you know? Now this is, look, it's almost, this one's almost come right away. There we are, there it has. So, I get the brush on this one and just and then also down there and now it should be a fairly straightforward job just putting some of the, the glue that's actually a really good time to do it because the glue stick was a bit mucked up with all the gluing that we've been doing today. I will put a little bit onto the actual book edge as well. And that is going to... Let me just need to carefully slide that back in. Apart from that, it's a nice copy. Number 622. I see someone's actually written on the front cover as well in pencil. Definitely didn't want that. Once again, it's, it's come up. That actually had so many faults with it and it's come up absolutely lovely. So I'm pleased with that. Just uh, we'll do the top edge in a minute to uh, to finish that off. Then the last one we'll look at today is this one, which is uh, The Gilt Kid, James Curtis 623. This one looks very, very nice by the look of it. Oh, once again, look, from the H. Arnold collection. So three of those today were from that collection. Brilliant. Right, so that's all the uh, pencil marks taken out and uh, 
all the gluing has been done. Next, we're going to need to do a little uh, brushing session. So let's crack on with that now. All right, let's get these brushed then. We'll put them into sort of convenient piles so we can work them quite well. Some are absolutely better than others, dust-wise. chores I remember weren't too bad coming off this crime one here so that was the one with the stained edge and I can only imagine what it's going to do to that Whoa. yes it was a very very dirty book look at that what a difference that's made so so dusty it's still coming off huge difference there of what was a really nice copy just really really dusty okay now let's do the same again with the next part so these are those HG Wells books The one which was looking really, really dirty. remember how old these books are you know talking 70 plus years so in that time they're bound to have picked up some dust bound to have
Lovely. I could almost see those top edges lightning in front of my eyes, you know. these in a similar sort of setup These were particularly dusty. <sighs> I think they look better. It's uh, just really, really bad, these four. Also seem fairly dusty along the top. say and these don't look too bad just one was looking a bit dusty
last wage I'm going to do in two lots, I think. Dirtyish copies of Hiroshima here. So we're gonna give these a good brush. Yes, I hope you've enjoyed looking through these penguins. I certainly have. A few I wasn't quite aware that they were as rough as they were, so uh, it's been good from that point of view to spy a few that I need to upgrade. So next week, I'll be pulling down the first of the hardbacks. So, uh, not sure how we're going to get on with those. I know they all need a bit of a dusting, but some have already been protected. Others, I'm just, I'm not sure how we're going to play it yet. So uh, it will be very interesting. That's for certain. But there is a fair old load of hardbacks and annuals and things like that large format books that I've never really shown on the channel at all which are going to need to be uh, put through the usual cleaning process so uh, they're probably overdue a good clean shall we say so yeah look out for those next week the first part of them yeah, if you have enjoyed today's video, looking at these vintage penguins, do please uh, give it the thumbs up. If you've not already, do please hit the subscribe button for regular cleaning videos. Now we do one video a week, it's all I've got time to do I'm afraid. And uh, 
so far I've managed to not miss a week amazingly. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so on my other channel. You can become a channel member through Patreon or through YouTube channel memberships, but that's on my other channel. I've not launched memberships on this particular one. But yeah, do leave the give the video a thumbs up. And I shall look forward to seeing you again in seven days' time with another cleaning video.